Good morning. I find it interesting how much more attentive you are than a lot of my students were. So, thank you for paying attention. Hey, welcome to the fourth forum for 2021. We feel really great to be back in session. Oh, well, by the way, I'm supposed to introduce myself. I'm Judy Ann Files. Thank you for being here. How many of you remember 1956? <laughs> <laughs> uh, a few others. <laughs> How many of you were in Montrose in 1956? No, I, I can't even play in that one. I was in old life if I went in Montrose. 1956, the community decided they wanted a swimming pool. Well, the city couldn't afford the swimming pool and the upkeep and all that. So the community came together and they allowed a special district to be determined. And so Montrose Recreation District was established, which was a special district just for a swimming pool. And the swimming pool was there on South 12th Street, about where Magic Circle is now. So it opened in 1957. But it wasn't until 1972 that the Recreation District had a full-time staff. Up until that time, it was just pool people during the summer. So in 1972, they started offering programs. So now, if you're, if you're as familiar with the Montrose Recreation District, that's a tremendous amount of growth to have been made in that 50 years, to have gone from no programming and just a pool to where it is right now. So this morning, I am welcoming, and I want to introduce you to Mar Mary Steinbach. She's the Executive Director of the Montrose Recreation District since September of 2019. She's been a public parks and recreation professional for 34 years, having graduated from Colorado State University. And she's over, she's over straightening the art on the wall. I love that, that's the thing I do. <laughs> as well as the University of Colorado at Denver, and has worked on the front range and spent several years in Grand Junction. Her sense of wonder and adventure has drawn her to live and work in Illinois, Alaska, Arizona, Vermont, Minnesota, South Carolina, and has now returned to her life back on the Western Slope, where she feels most at home. Happiest in the outdoors with her little dog, Bandit, Mary loves to share the ideals of an active lifestyle and finds exceptional satisfaction that she gets to help others find that too. Which is partly why she's so suited to be leading the district into its next chapter. So please, welcome Mary Sundar. Check, check, does this work? Can you guys hear me? Is it my mic? All right, so that was a great story of the Montrose Recreation District. Better than I'm gonna be able to tell it, really. Um, that was a very abbreviated form. Today, I'm going to share stories about the Montrose Recreation District from its very humble beginnings to the exceptional role that it plays in our community today. Um, so, as Judy had said, yes, the initiative for building a public swimming pool in Montrose actually began in May of 1945 when the citizens of Montrose decided that yes, we needed a public swimming pool and we needed a World War II war memorial. So it was the Lions Club who started this initiative, got all the service clubs on board and all the veterans groups on board, and they moved forward with trying to raise funds for this memorial and public pool. They had assembled probably bake sales, and a carnival, and their very, very first fundraiser, can you believe, raised $1,590 to contribute to this swimming pool. So it was really fun for me to look through the archives, look, read the local accounts of, you know, their accounting, like, you know, back in the days when some little old lady bookkeeper was making tallies of every single dollar raised and every single dollar spent on flyers and such. It was really fun to learn about really the bake sales that they had and the carnivals and the formation of the Veterans Memorial Pool Incorporated that ultimately bought the land on which the pool was placed. Um, and then in 1956, they established enough of a movement 
to create the Montrose Recreation Commission, which was the forerunner to the Recreation District. Their sole purpose at that time was to acquire and acquire land, construct and build the swimming pool, the bathhouse, and the concession stand. And I presume that they also assumed they wanted to operate this facility. So hopefully they raised more than the $1,590. Actually, they, they ultimately did, they moved forward with a ballot initiative that was passed by the people of Montrose overwhelmingly two to one. The original Veterans Memorial Pool was located at 12th and Cascade on what I believe is the land now that's uh, Magic Circle Players Theater, right? No? Where is it? It's a, the, the, uh, the pool shared the same parking lot as the Magic Circle. Yeah. The Magic Circle was there at the time. Perfect. It's those apartments okay. that are there now. Now, imagine, if you will, a beautiful, glorious Sunday afternoon, June 7th, 1957. Thousands turned out for the grand opening of our swimming pool. 400 people paid admission. And you know what they paid? 25 cents for every child under the age of 13. 50 cents for every adult. And you could rent swimming pool, you could rent <coughs> swimming suits and towels. And the men's suit went for 25 cents. And of course the ladies was a little more inflated at 50 cents. And you, get a, you can get a towel for 10 cents. So then somewhere along between 1956 and 1960, the Montrose Recreation District replaced the commission. Ultimately in 1975, they acquired their first property, which was Holly Park, which started its life as a football field. But the district was able to use land and water conservation funding to acquire and develop Holly Park. And we were honored to be able to rehabilitate Holly Park last year with a $1.6 million renovation that's turned it into this glorious space that it is today at the entrance of River Bottom Park. And then in 1986, the swimming pool moved to its current location, which is 25 Colorado Avenue, um, and which is at the corner of nine, uh, Colorado and Rio Grande. So that was our pool then, about the 1980s, the outdoor pool. And of course, we have the outdoor pool at its current location today. And of course, we've grown into this magnificent place um, that's the Community Recreation Center today. We still operate the outdoor pool. So it's cool that you know there have been so many different chapters of the Montrose Recreation District story along the way. But really, how is it that the MRV has come to be able to operate and operate more than a swimming pool? So it is a Title 32 special district as authorized by the Colorado State Statutes. It's a special district just like the Fire Protection District, water, sewer, library. We get our funding um, from property taxes, sales tax, fees and charges, and extra funds. So we have, we operate about a $7 million budget. And if you think about it, mostly that comes in thirds. So we get about a third of that funding from the property and special use taxes and it goes directly back into our annual operating budget. We get a third from the pass-through, or sorry, the fees and charges that we run, which we run our programs and our facilities. And we are lucky that we get to share in the sales tax via the city um, that goes toward retiring the debt on the Community Recreation Center. And then we have a smattering of, of dollars that comes to us from the Colorado Lottery, the Land and Water Conservation Fund through Great Outdoors Colorado, and that money goes back directly into mostly capital improvement projects. We service half of the county of, Mont of Montrose. Um, we have a population of just over, just under 32,000 people and 500 square miles. So this is who we are today. We run quality recreation facilities, programs, services. We enhance the learning and leisure and recreation of our community. We build that healthy community. <coughs> We for, so if you want to really boil it down, we provide healthy things to do and healthy places in which to do that. But beyond that, you see a word cloud up here. It's kind of like what we, what we represent, what we think we represent, what we know we represent, what we are to the people of Montrose. And really, we believe that we are about connections. The Montrose Recreation District is woven into the fabric of the community. We like to think of ourselves as a vital hub of activity. We're able to connect not only physical spaces, 
but social programs, wellness, health, and much, much more because we are a vital part of the way of life in Montrose. Uh, this is indicative of, these are two small examples of how we live our ideal of building healthy places and having healthy places in which to do fun things. Um, we're honored to be the recipient of two Starburst Awards given by the Colorado Lottery for the best use of, of lottery funds in the last, what, four years, three years. So we share our award with um, the city of Montrose for the Connect Trail. We were just awarded this past year. And our apologies to Scott Murphy because on the plaque that the lottery gave us, that's actually a picture of, their, of his river project, not the Connect Trail, but nonetheless. It all works together. See, it's all about connections. We are all connected and we cannot separate ourselves. And then in 2018, we were awarded the Starburst Award for the Community Recreation Center. So what about places? What about people? Now, I want to showcase our programs and our facilities and our activities. So true to our origins, we operate a full service aquatics program. We also operate 50 plus activities, uh, sports for both youth and adults, fitness programs, youth enrichment programs and outdoor programs as our general categories. We do a whole lot more though. Um, we run hundreds of annual programs and activities in each of those areas that I mentioned and we contact more than 10,000 individual program participants per year. Over the years we definitely added to that swimming pool. There were a lot of changes that were made to the, out, to, the, to the outdoor pool and then it became the indoor pool with the field house in 2017. I'm sorry, remained the outdoor pool. Um, we expanded on that site and built our 20,000 square foot field house in 2017. We've helped to extend the city's connect trail. In 2017 we built the 82,000 square foot gem of our community facility, the Community Recreation Center, which is still the newest and the biggest and the best recreation center on the entire Western Slope. So over all this time, we have, we've, uh, we've gained five properties. We have about 65 acres and we operate the two indoor facilities. We actually operate three indoor facilities because we partner with the city of Montrose and we manage the Montrose Senior Center at the Pavilion. Um, we also manage portions of, well, we manage Cerise Park, sections of the Connect Trail. And the city has, has continued to grow as well. So kind of for years, the division has always been that the Montrose Recreation District runs the recreation programs and the city of Montrose manages the parks. And so it takes both of us, the city and the district, to run a full service parks and recreation department, which is why later on, am I being too loud? Sorry, just close the doors. I have a class. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, it's going to be more important than ever. I get into a section a little bit later about the master plan. It's going to be really important that we continue to work together um, to figure out how we're going to adapt to our growing and changing community. The CRC, the Community Recreation Center, of course, is the pride and gem of our operations. It consumes the most resources, but it brings us the most resources. We see about 8,000 visits per week at that center. Um, that equals about 350,000 visits per year. Think about that. That's about, like, what, 16 times the population of Montrose? Um, so we're a very, very busy, active, vibrant place, and we love it. The average sales coming in gen, uh, in a typical year, one and a half million dollars to su support that facility. The field house brings us another $250,000 per year. Um, so far in, 20, in 2020, even while we were shut down principally, um, the primary uses of the field house were Montrose High School, sports, um, after school admission program, and senior activities. So we don't always only do standalone programs. We also rely wholeheartedly on uh, collaborations and partnerships. And so we're able to strengthen our community by being in the know of what's going on and who's doing what 
and, and, and responding to when people have a seed of an idea. They get together with the, with the MRD and we sit down at the table and we can germinate that seed and make it grow into something, something really tangible and something very valuable for the community. So as really small examples, we partner with All Points Transit every summer to bring the Kids Ride Free program to make sure that youth under the age of 18 have free rides throughout the summer. So we're effectively paying for the route that takes participants back and forth between the recreation center and wherever, wherever it is they want to go. We're working with the school district on the outdoor learning center that we heard, we heard about last week. Um, and we're wanting to make sure that we that the community has access to the outdoor learning center and that outdoor recreation because that's just as important for all of us as it is for the kids. And we're working with the Valley Food Partnership using our community garden as a stimulus, as a nutrition hub to figure out how to address the food desert and the gaps in nutrition throughout the community. So those are three really, really tiny examples, but when little ideas come to the table, they turn and grow into something magnificent that helps make all of us stronger and better and builds this community. So I want to talk a little bit about our benefits of services. You heard me say earlier that we're about fun things to do and fun places to do them, but we're really more about that. The National Recreation and Park Association calls for us to develop high-performing public spaces. They're not just ball fields. They're not just places to go have a picnic. As we continue to build out our system, we need to acknowledge that parks are green infrastructure, and they're a vital part of developing this community just as streets are, just as bridges, water, sewer, and all of that. And they provide multiple maximal co-benefits throughout the community. They're healthy spaces, they drive tourism, they build community resilience, and they help drive the economy. How do they help drive the economy? How does the, part, how does the Montrose Recreation District drive the economy? Through the people we employ. The environment that we build that attracts and retains businesses, which in turn supports the housing market and boosts the home values to supporting our local businesses through the supplies that we purchase, to building the wellness and health of our community, diminishing the healthcare costs, all of those benefits and much more. So the results from the recent analysis that's done every single year, and unfortunately we only have the data now from 2017, but it shows that local public parks and recreation, and that's agencies, that's not federal, Parks and Recreation Agencies. That's not state parks and recreation agencies. That's local, like the Montrose Recreation District. Support, generate more than $166 billion in economic activity. They support more than 1.1 million jobs and they pay more than $51 billion in salaries and benefits. And Colorado is always a consistently high performer, always being in the top 10 states. And here in Colorado, we show that we generate $4.5 billion in transactions, which boosts the gross domestic product here in Colorado. We employ more than $34,000, and we pay nearly $1.5 billion in wages and benefits. Now I'm going to shift to COVID-19 and 2020. I've been a parks and recreation professional for 34 years. Many of the district staff have been professionals for nearly that long. We pour our heart and soul into making sure that we deliver a healthy lifestyle and we grow community every single day, one person at a time. You can imagine how crushing it was to not be able to see our people when we close our programs, when we close our doors, at the Community Recreation Center at the Field House. We're used to being out there every single day and not to be able to do that broke our hearts. But it did not break our spirit. So we all closed the doors to the centers, we closed down the programs, and went home to my home office. 
and within two days, we were presented an opportunity to partner with the city of Montrose and ultimately the school district to deliver on their nutrition program. They recognized that there were a lot of families who couldn't make it to our nutrition hubs to pick up their sack lunches every day. So we deployed our vans, we deployed our people and our resources, and we deliver more than school lunches. We deliver happiness, health, and hope. And I've got a short reel for you to view, and I hope this works out. handing out the equipment and giving the balls the balls out yeah. the beginning and seeing them, the kids get all excited and then the balls all disappeared within the first day but it was fun to put those on yeah, it was good to be out there to community because that's the visual base like the door, since we were closed it was nice to have us around and everyone not pretty friendly so it's waving at people you know, still by, knowing that we're still around even though we're not open yet
So there you go. We do deliver phenomenally more than just school lunches. And that's in everything that we do. It's not just about the fun and games. It's not just about the, the activity that is most evident right before you. It's all of the other things that we do that are wrapped into that, that are connected to the things that we do. So here's where we get into kind of the timeline of how things worked, specifically related to the Community Recreation Center and our programs. Uh, it's sort of meant to be dizzying to you because it was dizzying to us. It was highly chaotic, but we managed to bring a lot of order and learn a lot of great lessons through our activities of the last year. Um, and all along, we developed this ideal of making the Community Recreation Center the safest place to play in Montrose. And we, re we remain vigilant in that ideal as well. And so that was kind of a common theme that really helped bring us all together and helped us to, to continue to, to deliver the best in services. So March 15th, we shut down, right? And then we continued the Route Riders program all the way through um, June 30th. March through May, we conducted really intensive scrubbing, cleaning, disinfecting. We always clean, we always uh, close down the community recreation center for two weeks in the fall anyway. And so this allowed us to get a start on that and actually conduct all of the cleaning and annual maintenance that we would have done so that we wouldn't have to close down when it was time for us to reopen. From March on, we studied every single communication that came from the state, it came from the feds, it came from the CDC and the WHO and from our professional network and from National Recreation Park Association. We wanted to do every possible scenario play that we could to figure what if, what if we could do that, what if we can't do that. We learned a lot from our peers in the field and we saw them doing something, we'd try it. Um, and we think about really intentionally, really focused about how we could best mobilize to get open as soon as we could and in what capacity. Um, May 5th, we had a board election. Um, that was only six weeks into the pandemic. So we figured out real fast how to do our mail-in balloting and run a really safe campaign. We had lots of people come out to the Community Recreation Center and uh, we ran a really safe election. Uh, June 2nd, only four weeks after that election, we had limited reopening of the Community Recreation Center. And we could only have 50 people at a time. We had to require the masks. We put the memberships on hold so that people wouldn't feel like they were obligated to continue to pay their membership fees. And we created the Pandemic Punch Pass, which was a discounted admission that they could purchase and use at the center, given our limited capacity and our restrictions. We nearly completely rearranged the community center. We moved the game room over to the lobby. We moved fitness equipment down to the game room. We moved fitness equipment down to the gym. We spaced everything out. We did all of the things we, did, we could do to create a truly crazy, chaotic space for our participants, but they actually grew to love it. The people who came back really enjoyed seeing what we had done, and we enjoyed interacting with our folks. Our full-time staff became facility experts. We were the MOD ship, the, the manager on duty. We were the fitness attendants chasing you around with the disinfecting bottles as we kept our equipment cleaner than it's ever been, except when it was brand new. Um, we did that so that we could reconnect with our patrons. And then when we were able to bring back our part-time, it really helped us in our training efforts. We knew exactly what to expect, but we knew how to train our folks and how to deliver. We put together frequently asked questions. Every, again, every possible what if that we could think of that people would ask about. Well, could you do that? Could you do that? What if this happens? And so it really helped us to focus on communicating not only to our public, but to our staff as well. So back to that timeline, June 15th, we were able to start our summer enrichment program over at the field house. Only 50% capacity, but we ran that program really successfully all summer long, serving children under the age of 15. June 16th, our outdoor pool. We had limited capacity there. We'd only put 
25 people at a time, but we figured out a new management structure which continues today because it helps us manage and it helps us optimize our revenue. By July 6th, we had expanded our hours at the center and we were slowly opening this place up and this space up so that we could bring more and more and more people back in. Then August 1st came and we reactivated all of our season passes and we promptly lost half of them. People just canceled their memberships. So that was a big blow, but we have been clawing our way back, and I'm really happy to report that as of today, we're about 80% capacity what we were pre-pandemic. And the CRC is a vibrant, happy place, the outdoor pool is a happy place, and all of that. Uh, shift gears just slightly. A recent survey found that five in six U.S. adults agreed that visiting their local parks, trails, and open spaces is essential for their mental and physical well-being during the COVID-19 pandemic. We wholeheartedly agree. Consider these life-changing stories. A lady recently joined the CRC after almost losing her eye to diabetes. Her brother had recently lost his leg also to diabetes and she was his caregiver following his surgery. She joined the CRC because she did not want to go through the same thing that he had gone through and she's been coming to walk regularly at the center when, and she gets a ride on All Points Transit in order to get there too. And she stops by our front desk regularly to tell us what a difference the CRC has made in her life, how well she's feeling, her blood counts are improving, and now she's encouraging her son to join. Another regular is 84 years old. He's diabetic, he comes in regularly and now is no longer needing to be on medication for his diabetes solely based on his coming to the CRC regularly. That is a true success story. Carol, not her real name, lives by herself. She was widowed a couple of years ago. She enjoys participating in senior programs because she enjoys talking to people. And she knows that it's vitally important as she moves through her grief. Our program, programmers know that this is a consistent theme among people who participate in our recreation programs, that they report having improved mental and physical health because of their increased activity level and their participation in our programs. Bill, also not his real name, has seen a great improvement in his health since he started playing pickleball. He said his cholesterol went down, his blood pressure is improved, and he's experienced weight loss. He said, it's not work, but play, and he loves it, and it keeps him young. We bring families together to play together. We provide safe places for kids in their out-of-school hours, serving as a substitute family often, or being the only thing keeping them out of harm's way. Where would all these people be, the hundreds, the thousands of people like them, without the benefits of the Montrose Recreation District? We continue to relax on all of the restrictions that we put forward in the pandemic uh, as we continue to make recovery. However, as I said before, we do remain vigilant and we're ready to respond if we do have a resurgence. We remain the safest place to play in all of Montrose and we'll do everything we can to ensure our rightful place at the center of our community. So where are we today? We've rebounded, like I said, nearly 80% participation at the Community Recreation Center, 100% participation at our outdoor pool. We can't accommodate everybody who wants to come out and play. Uh, and our programs exploded. So, what's now, what's next? I'm gonna shift gears real quick to our Copperheads and Magic Plan. When you walked in, you all received the card. You haven't figured out what to do with it. Now is your time to start paying attention. <laughs> uh, the MRD has not had a true master plan and how to talk about how we deliver our parks and recreation services really since 2004. Now they've made a lot of great movement and progress throughout the years and they've done micro assessments and inventories to figure out what we have and what we don't have. But this is now our time to continue to figure out how we're going to shape the services in parks and recreation for the whole of Montrose as we move forward as our population does continue to grow. 
Like I said, we're about 32,000 in population right now. Our projections, if nothing else changes by 2035, will be nearly 40,000 people in the Montrose Recreation District. Um, but we've been working with our consultant and we're kicking off our comprehensive master plan and our um, interactive website, which is makemymontrose.com. And I think you'll see that on the business card. We're trying to figure out a way to make this the most interactive, the most engaging master plan you all have ever seen in Montrose. Our objectives with this master plan are to engage the community, get excellent input, uh, make you choose what things are most important for you to see. We're going to use lots of different data points and best practices. We're going to analyze our reports. We're going to analyze and compare them to all of the different um, plans that we have already out there in our community. We're going to determine our own levels of service and how and when and why and where we provide those. And we're going to be intentional with our strategies and we're going to consider the best in professional, professional practices in order to develop those strategies. And then we want to make sure that we're able to fund and clearly operate on those new strategies when we have them. So this is our roadmap for the upcoming year when we'll be working on this comprehensive plan. We're, going, we're conducting right now, we're conducting our assessment, our inventory to find out what we currently have and what our gaps are. Well, as I said, we'll survey, we'll analyze, and we'll compare uh, and match up all of our community plans and all the public realm plans that are all around us. And we're going to prioritize and create implementable strategies to ensure that all of those strategies match up to what the community is truly telling us they want to see. Shifting gears just a little bit again. Every year, the Trust for Public Land puts forward its Parks Metrics Project. This is going to be a minor key in our master plan. It's one of the metrics that we'll look at. It shows, uh, let me go back. It back, back in time, once upon a time, I like to tell a story, uh, our levels of service were defined by how many park acres you had, how many playgrounds you had, what amenities you had per 100,000 population. Things have gotten a lot more complicated since the times when those levels of service were defined. And today, measures of success are defined by how far, by the 10 minute walk campaign. That is, how far does someone live with, from their parks? Is the entire community served by being able to walk 10 minutes to get to their park, trail, or open space. In Montrose, we find that 68% of our community does in fact live within that 10 minute walk, which means that our current population in the district, <coughs> nearly 7,000 people do not have that access. Now, some of you are farmers. Some of you walk miles and miles a day around your farm, and you may not need to have access, close access, but well, we believe it's important that everyone does because the people who don't live within that 10 minute walk are at risk for increased bouts of depression and stress and poor mental health outcomes. And they're at risk of poor physical health. They're more vulnerable to environmental and social and financial disadvantages and so much more. It is vital that we continue to fill the gap on this 10 minute walk campaign as Montrose continues to grow and develop and more people move to town. And it will be increasingly vital and important that the city of Montrose works together with the Montrose Recreation District to build all of the strategies and to develop a holistic parks and recreation system that serves all of our needs today and well into the future. So this is your call to action today. I gave you the business <coughs> cards. Some of you have been playing with them throughout the meeting. Some of you have already gone on and found our survey monkey, uh, our survey, and filled out its quick four questions. You can interact with us at makemymontrose.com. We'll ask you for your feedback. Your open-ended comments are most welcome. We're capturing all of those details. We've gotten some really valuable information so far. 
in terms of what people like and what they don't like. We'll be launching actually our own mobile app in, a, in a, about a week um, that will let you be out in the parks. And when you're in a park, you can just click on that app and tell us what you like, what you don't like, and give us your feedback. Um, in July, probably late July, we'll be sell, sending out a statistically valid survey. If you're one of the lucky recipients, please fill it out and send it back in. Um, and then we're using all of this other information as anecdotal evidence and support for the comprehensive match plan. We'll get a full report on the general findings about probably about September of this year, and we'll be sure to report out to you all of those findings. And again, you'll find all of that information on Make My Montrose. Uh, at the end, if you haven't brought your mobile device and you want to fill out the Survey Monkey, we've got an iPad set up for you. So you go ahead and plug on in. We really, truly, 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 truly want to hear from you. It is really important to us. Um, so that's what I have for you today. Um, thank you so much for your time and attention. I hope that wasn't like way too much stuff crammed in. Um, but let's open it up for dialogue and hear your thoughts. We got it. I'm still kind of reeling from all the facts and numbers and stuff. Yeah. So please, if you have questions, you have comments, let me know. I'll bring you the mic. Please do not shout out your comments because some people cannot hear as well as others. You need a mic. Thanks, Mary. Uh, just my quick story is we lived in Arvada, um, and they just built the Apex Center. You know that probably. Yep. And um, we were just a couple of blocks away, and we would take our bikes down, take our girls down, ride the bikes to the Apex Center, spend half a day there, and it was just beautiful. Half of it was a pool, half of it was a skating rink. So it was vibrant. They had skating um, teams till three in the morning or whatever, all 24 hours a day, basically, they used the skating park because it's so expensive to have a skating rink. Anyway, then we decided to move to Montrose, and we're, checking out the town, and we said, where's the rec district? And a realtor said, well, do you mean the pool? I said, well, whatever. And so she told us where it was, where the field house is now. So we go there, and we walk in, and we said, can we get a tour of the rec, this rec building? And she goes, do you mean the pool? I said, yeah. I said, just walk around the corner. So we walk around the corner, walk in, the, in there, and it's just a lap pool with a couple uh, people swimming in laps in there. And it was just really rusty, blue, run down. And I told my girls and my wife, I said, well, welcome to Montrose. This is all we have. And so we were so depressed until we you know, got this rec center. Um, we worked with uh, uh, boy, Dean uh, Palmquist, way back years ago, trying to see if we could even get that passed. That didn't work. And so then under Ken Sherbino. But uh, now we're so proud that we have this because it's, this is so important. When people are looking to move, they want to see the rec center and see what activities we have. So I think this is part of the reason why so many people are moving here is because of that. And I'm very proud to have it here. That's a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing. And as Barbara walked in this morning, she recounted to me that she, uh, eight years ago today, popped up on her Facebook memory. She was here at the forum selling the idea of that community recreation center and so today we are so immensely grateful to each and every one of you all who were here thanks so much and uh we yeah, we are just so blessed as a community to have this which is still the best and the brightest and the largest rec center on the Can you say that before <laughs> so so mary i really want to thank you and your staff for the excellent response you've had during the pandemic um, we, we stopped going for a while and uh, we recently came back. Uh, the staff is friendly, the place is spotless. I like the new fans that you have in there, lots of ventilation and things like that. Looks like the, there's a resurgence in the, in the programs and so forth. People are starting to uh, um, you know, come back. Uh, the question I have though is uh, about your business plan. Yeah. And, um, Barbara, and I, Barbara and I have had some discussions about this, but um, the um, the initial uh, business model was was based on fees and memberships uh, to make you know to make it all balance out. And um, originally there was you, I think you got like four times the number of memberships 
that you needed to to meet that monthly yep. uh, debt. Um, and there was some discussion about maybe, you know maybe paying down the loan sooner or adding more programs or whatever. And then the pandemic hit, and you're telling me now that, or telling us now that we, we're back at 80%. Um, what is the, uh, the long range uh, financial uh, outlook for the district? Yeah, finances are good, actually. Um, we were fortunate that probably, you know, nearly 60 to 70% of our operations are tied directly, they are direct program and facility expenses, right? So when we close our doors, it actually costs us less to operate than it would normally, because we subsidize a fair amount. Remember only a third comes from, a third of our revenue comes from fees and charges. We ended the year because we were able to reduce our expenses while at the same time we reduced all those revenues. We ended the year in a better financial position than we had projected to. Moving forward into this year, and we deferred some of our capital improvement projects, and that helped, for sure. Moving forward into this year, we budgeted conservatively at only 25, at only 75% of our typical operations, and we basically draw down, drew down our reserve in order to continue to fund capital improvements and some of our operations. Moving forward, we're in a good spot. We will be challenged by the number of increased amenities and increased services that we know that our community will ask for through this master planning process. And it will be up to us. Fortunately, we've got a great board of directors and really smart people involved to serve on our finance committee and our growth committee. And it's going to be up to all of us to figure out those strategies. When I talk about the master plan strategies, that's part of it. We have to be able to fund the things that we want to do. So our consultant's going to be able to work with us to figure out some alternative revenue sources to help us continue to deliver these services moving forward. As you noted, I think it was a 10-year plan, or it was at least a five-year plan when they opened the doors, like how, how much we will how many people we will attract and how much revenue we will bring. And we met those projections within two years. Great credit to the staff and board and Ken who came before to be able to deliver on that. So if we're in, we're in a great spot, ready to launch and ready to figure out all those strategies that are going to keep us in a really financially sustainable mode. Other questions? Okay, Kathy, I'm running. <laughs> <laughs> I realize you've completed a lot of big things, um, notably the play area at the entrance to River Bottom. I've heard rumors about other things. The back end of the rec center, the bare ground, um, are those going to be soccer fields? And at one time, I heard that you might want to acquire the land beyond that, and then you decided not to. What projects are out there that you're considering? Yeah. So that's a great question. Uh, originally, you know, the, the community recreation center was planned as a free phase. So. Phase one was building the center. Phase two was building, uh, my, I, I'm gonna get my orders mixed up, but one, one phase was to develop multi-use fields, basketball court, picnic pavilion, out to the east of the facility. We own that whole 26 acre parcel. So that area was gonna be developed and additional parking was going to be added. We were able to add the pickleball court so on, the, on the southwest corner of the parcel um, and then the final phase was the outdoor pool. So where the pool exists now, just pushing out to the outdoor and making a great outdoor play park as well. Um, we continue to look for grants. Uh, we've been working with Great Outdoors Colorado. We work with the city of Montrose in terms of potentially acquiring additional properties. Um, some, of the feed, some of the early feedback that we have from people from on the master planning parcel process is that 
They're really interested in trails. Soft surface, more land, open space, like you will see on the Front Range. It's hard to think of, you know, us in Montrose as needing open space, right? But as more people come and more people develop, that is going to be critically important. So we're going to have to put together a land acquisition program as well. Um, but people want trails. They, the state's being overrun with people trying to get out to the wilderness and into their backyards and connect. And you know, Denver has an extensive trail system, which is awesome. And you can get from far north to far south. And so we're going to have to look at developing something like that. Um, and then the other thing that's come up in master planning process is we have this beautiful hub of the Community Recreation Center. <clears throat> but what about the people who live right now, live in Northeast Montrose? There's really nothing for them out there. There are a few parcels, there are the neighborhood parks, but there's nothing regional, nothing big community-based for them. So some folks have introduced the concept of potential satellite facilities that provide indoor space as well as some outdoor properties. So those are uh, just a few of the ideas on the drawing board so far. See, this is my workout for the day. That's all I wanted you to probably see. Talk I just about wanted to get your heart rate up a little bit. <laughs> uh, just a little trivia history. Uh, does anybody know the very first community pool in Montrose County was not in Montrose mm -hmm. City? Oh. Yeah. You're a van. <laughs> Where is that? They had a pool in your <laughs> Where is that? Yeah. She's not well, it's no longer there. <laughs> <laughs> it's north of Nattery. It's north of Nattery. Okay. When was that? No. What's that? When was that? Nineteen eighty nine. Well, they made the uranium for the A bombs in World War II, so 40s, like early 50s. Place to swim. <laughs> well, they, I saw the pool. I was here when the pool was still there, but it's all gone now. The whole wow. town is. It was a company town, Union Carbide. Wow. So you said that was 1947? It was there Something a while. Like yeah, yeah. I knew I worked with a gal at BLM who actually was born and raised over there, and she wow. told me that. She oh, said, oh, yeah, we got cool. the first pool in Montreal. Wow. <laughs> all right. Got, you know, it was maybe 20 by 30. It wasn't very big, but there wasn't that many people in Europe. Probably about like our outdoor swim tank now. Yeah. 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 Is that what we're reading? Right. I love the stories. No, exactly. Now we know what Dennis's problem is. He went swimming in my pool. That's low. That's a hard load. I owe you one. Um, time to change it. I'd like to know. You have solar panels on the community recreation center. How much energy does that provide? And I'm really glad that that is a contribution to the solar. Frank, that's a great point. I don't have the answer for that, but bring your business card back to me for coffee and we'll chat and I'll get you that with those facts and figures. Okay. I know you have electric vehicle stations. We do. Them. We have charging stations mm -hmm. at behind the CRC, and we hope to eventually be able to put those in at Holly Park and River Bottom, River Bottom Park. So, yeah, it's, it's all it's all part of you know. Again, we're more than fun and games. It's well, how do we contribute to the environment? How do we offset all of our negative impacts that we have on our on our globe? Right. So. We have to embark on these solar initiatives and new energy initiatives and embrace those things because the parks and recreation system is a part of that green infrastructure. So vitally important, keeping the quality of life so high here in Montrose. Mm -hmm. The ongoing drought. Mm -hmm. so, right. Right. <laughs> Again? <coughs> you got another story? Yeah. So, so I'm into children, okay? And uh, I just wanted to know the uh, Recreation Foundation provides scholarships. Can you talk a little bit about that? Thank you so much for bringing that up because that was the part that I failed to to um, cover. But yes, our arm is the Montrose Recreation Foundation, and they do a remarkable job in, um, in delivering funds to us that enable scholarships for youth as well as for seniors. 
I'm hoping ultimately they grow. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your background or anything. Scholarships, a scholarship, a scholarship. We all need healthy living. We all need that active lifestyle. But I wish I had the number to date, but I know that every year they are able to give us between five and $10,000 directly toward offsetting program fees for our program participants. And they are a vital link to us being able to deliver the services that we do. Um, there's also an annual campaign that we do at the Community Recreation Center hand in hand with the foundation and as the giving tree. So we'll put ornaments up on the tree and let people contribute and we're able to deliver entire program fees to families in need. So we'll get all the kids in a family to be able to participate in the youth basketball program or any of our sports programs. We'll give away facility memberships to any families in need. We have a lot of business partners who help us with that. We have a lot of private, really generous contributors to that fund. So um, be on the lookout always for foundation activities. They run the Black Canyon Triathlon coming up in October. It's October 3rd this year, and it is their primary fundraiser. Um, and they're in their 20th year of delivering that event going into this year. So, um, and, and we were able to last year, that's another thing, Bill, is that in January? That must have been in January of 2020. We were able to run the indoor triathlon with their assistance as well. First time we ever tried that. So there's all kinds of ways for people to connect with us and be involved and to contribute funds to make sure that we are delivering a healthy community. I'm not really, you know, uh, so I've, I've been a member there and no one's ever asked, no one's ever asked me to contribute, you know, additional <coughs> money on my membership you know so if you had you had what uh, my math is right if you had 360,000 visits you know if everyone paid a dime more that's thirty six thousand dollars brilliant you want to be on our foundation group <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really good. we we have started a roundup so that when you uh have a transaction at the rec district that you can just automatically round up and that money goes into the foundation scholarship fund as well. I'm not exactly 100% sure where they are on getting that going, but we know that that's an option. <coughs> that is a brilliant idea. Oh. Don't, don't tell us. That's the first great. one you <laughs> 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 the broken, broken clock is right. Mary, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank this you has all. been fantastic. Yeah. And I, I really do, if you want to bring that business card back to me at the center, I'll treat you to a cup of coffee. <laughs> okay. Next week, Katie Jurgensen will be here to talk to us about <laughs> Montrose County. Okay? It's 9 o'clock. Go to work. <laughs>